He grew up needing nothing but wanting everything. He wasn't like his brother. His brother was very content with where he was at. He was very content with who he was, what he did, all of that kind of stuff. Didn't really want to go anywhere, but at the large family farm, he was very content at the at the family farm. But the younger brother, man, he, he had that, that itch to get out of town, uh, make a name for himself, see the sights, go to the city, do all of that kind of stuff. He didn't want to just be bogged down in this small little community. Sure, they were the big fish in a little pond, but but man, he was he was kind of over it. He wanted to go somewhere uh, where where nobody knew who he was, where he would make a name for himself. And so he stormed into his dad's office and demanded that he have his inheritance. Now, this was a big deal at this place in time. You don't just come in and ask your dad for your, your share of the inheritance while he's still alive. Basically, when you say that, you're saying that, uh, dad... You might as well be dead. I wish you were dead. Now give me my inheritance. And I imagine that as the dad looks at the son, bewildered and shocked that his son is even asking for this, but doesn't know what else to do. Knows the son, knows his heart, knows what he wants. And so the the, the father gives the son exactly what he wants, his share of the inheritance. And over the next few days, the son is making plans, scheming. How is he going to get out? What's he going to do? Making plans to go to the large city far away from this little town. Get as far away from that life, that lifestyle, that family, that farm, and make a name for himself. Get as far away as he possibly can because it wasn't a bad upbringing, but he wanted to see the world. And so he goes. A few days later, he packs his bags and out he heads towards the big city. And once he gets to the big city, I mean, there's everything in front of them. Anything you could ever want, he had right in front of him. He uh, he, he stopped to eat at this this little restaurant. I mean, there's so many decisions to make, but and you don't want to make any of them on an empty stomach. So he goes to a place to eat and he opens up the menu. And there before him is is food of every ethnicity, every place that he could think of where food came from. It was all right there. Some of it he knew about, some of it he didn't. Some of it he knew he could eat, some of it he knew he really shouldn't eat. And so he, you know, he, he, he starts looking at the menu and there's a little, little twinge of, of his conscience starts to, to peek in a little bit, which was kind of surprising because you think when you go away from home, man, you leave all of that stuff behind. You don't bring any of that with you. You're starting fresh. You're starting brand new. But man, that, that little voice in his head started, started speaking up. Maybe you shouldn't eat that. Maybe you shouldn't drink that. So he does, a, as what most people would do, he kind of just does it a little bit, uh, he he goes with what's what's familiar to him. He eats a nice meal. He eats something that uh, he would eat at home. You know, there's a lot of time to embrace all of the things in the city. Why why try to indulge everything all at once? And and as he's eating that meal, a, a waiter brings over uh, a sample of a of 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 an adult beverage, something that he had before at feasts and weddings and parties, all that kind of stuff, but never in this scenario, never in this environment, and certainly not the way that people were drinking it at this establishment. So he had the alcoholic beverage, and pretty soon one turns into two, two turns into three, three turns into four. And he gets up pays the bill, kind of stumbles back. He's like, ah, that was a little stronger than I thought. And he thinks, I've got to go find a place to live here in this city if I'm going to be here for a while. So he takes his money with him, his inheritance, and there's still plenty there. And he finds a place to live. It's a cush spot, a good landing spot, a little bit more pricey than what maybe his dad would have paid for had he stayed in the city. But this is the son. He's making a name for himself. Even his older brother probably wouldn't play, stay in a place like this, but he is sparing no expense. And people notice around him that, man, he's sparing no expense to do this whole thing. So he goes and he, 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 he gets a nice place to live. <clears throat> and then he's like, well, time to go meet some new people. And uh, so he goes out and, and he tries to find uh, a good time. You can go anywhere and find a good time. It, it's, it's to be had anywhere. So he goes, uh, you, you don't really have to look that far to find a, 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 a good 
a good time. And it's not hard to find friends when you're the one paying for all the drinks. So he goes to another establishment and he, he sees a group of people that he might want to be friends with, asks if he can buy them a round of, of drinks. And of course they oblige and they start having a good time. They party all night. And when the bar closes down, they say, hey, let's go back to your place. And he's like, you know, I just got this new place. I'd love to show it off. So so all of the friends go back over there. Uh, they're hanging out. They're having a good old time. And, 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 and basically at some point he blacks out and doesn't remember a single thing. He wakes up in the morning, kind of groggy, has a has a, a headache, a hangover. There's people in his room that he doesn't recognize. There's people in the living room. And he slowly gets up, he stumbles out of bed, he puts his clothes on. And he remembers one of them saying at some point, oh, man, we're going to have to have something more to drink in the morning to cure this hangover. And as he's getting over to go over there, he just remembers, oh, that little conscience starts bugging him again. What are you doing, man? This isn't you. And you know what silence is that? Another drink. So he has another drink. And everybody starts to kind of wake up slowly but surely. And he'd always wanted to go to the track to do some gambling. And so him and his friends, new friends, they all go to the track and they do some gambling. And, and they all place bets. And once you know, he wins. He, he wins. Uh, it, it, that was unusual. He usually doesn't win at many things, but he won here. So it must be some sort of, of blessing going his way that everything's going to work out just great. And this is his lifestyle for week after week after week. The weeks turn into months and, and he's continuing this lifestyle. The winning didn't always keep going, but the drinking sure did, the party sure did, the friends and all that kind of stuff, that was still going strong. And he feels like he's never going to lose that inheritance because he had won some money, so he's feeling great. So one morning he wakes up, he, as he always does, a little bit hungover, a little bit uh, just groggy, all of the friends still there mooching off of him at this point. And he goes and checks his safe to see how much he's got left in his investment. And he looks in the safe and panic starts to hit because there's nothing there. How, how could this be? How could there be absolutely nothing in the safe? So quickly he wakes up his friends. Did, did any, of, any of you guys see any of my, my money that I, I had around? And, and slowly they're rubbing their eyes all hung over as well. And like, I don't know what you're talking about. He starts panicking, he's flipping blankets over, he's flipping cushions everywhere he could possibly... He, he takes the hammer to the piggy bank to see if anything comes out of there. There's nothing. And he sheepishly has to go to his friends and be like, oh, do, you, um, do you guys have any money? Rent is due. And once you know, you really find out who your friends are in this type of a scenario, don't you? One by one, they all turn and be like, I, I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I don't have anything. I got nothing. Uh, and then they start making excuses. Oh, you know what? She, she I, I should probably go visit my parents, she says. I, they haven't heard from me in a while. I'm going to go check on them. Another friend's like, you know what? I've got work. I got to go. Another one's like, oh, man, I have, I have some appointments I got to get to. And then all of a sudden, he's empty, both internally and, and in the apartment. There's no one but him. And he's got no money, no job, and no friends. He's thinking, I, I better do something. He thinks about his dad. He thinks about his brother. I could go back to the farm. Ah, no. No, I'd never live that one down. I'm not going to do that. There's a market here in town. You know what? I'm a farmer, have been a farmer. I'm going to go back. My family has been farmers for a long time. I'm going to go to the market. I'm going to see if I can find a job there. So he, he gets on his clothes and he heads down, uh, turns to down the street to go towards the market. And he knows, notices a lot of closed up shops. Some of the shops are, are just, they're, they're, they're closed up. They're not open anymore. And it's like, well, that's strange. I, I guess I never really noticed that before. Whether it was the alcohol or just not paying attention to his surroundings. But anyway, he, he finally gets to the market and... And, and, and there's a lot less vendors than what he remembered. And so he's going from vendor to vendor, and there's not much on the table at each one of these places. From vendor to vendor, he's going from place to place and seeing, man, do you guys have any work available? And each one is saying, no, we got no work. I mean, can you see? We hardly have any produce. Finally, when he asks one vendor, man, do you have any work? And the vendor's like, are you kidding? Don't you understand what's happening right now? Sheepishly, the, the younger brother is like, um, 
I n- no, I don't. What what's going on? And the vendor says, "Man, we're in a we're in a famine. Have been for a while. This is one of the worst ones we've seen." A sweat starts to trickle down his face. He gets a lump in his throat because he has nowhere to go, nothing to do, and no money. A little bit more frantically, he's going from vendor to vendor trying to find a place that'll take him as a job. He passes by a pig farmer and he's like, Ugh, I've sacrificed a lot in my life. I'm not going to go there. All of my upbringing, I've, I've done a lot and I've, I've, uh, I've cashed in on a lot of it and, and I've uh, traded in a lot of it, but I'm not ready to, to pass that one over yet. And he keeps looking and looking and looking, and there's no job, no job, no job. So now his option are go to the pig farmer, which looks like he's doing well, or go back home to dad and brother. And they'll never accept him. So he goes to the pig farmer. Walking back and forth between, uh, in front of the pig farmer vendor and his stand of, of all of the stuff that he's got there. He's thinking back and forth and, and the pig farmer, I mean, this is a sight to see for the pig farmer. He's got to be like, what is this guy doing? Going back and forth, back and forth. I don't understand. Uh, he's, 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 he's pacing back and forth thinking, okay, I, I'm, I'm not actually going to eat the pig. I'll just, I'll work at it. I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll feed the pigs. I'll do that kind of stuff, but I'm not going to eat the pig. That would be wrong for me to eat the pig. And so, uh, he, he goes to the pig farmer and is like, do you have any jobs? Jobs available, and the pig farmer is like, um, "You're crazy, man." But um, yeah, I can I can put you to work. So he goes with the pig farmer to to where the pig farmer lives, and and he gets his quarters. And that very day, the pig farmer gives him some food to to give to the pigs. These these little things that the pigs can eat, and he he's carrying it around. Um, pigs eat this food raw. People can eat it if it's roasted. He's carrying it around. He's giving it to all the pigs, and and um, that night he's thinking, "Boy, I'm." I'm hungry. I haven't eaten anything yet today. I'm sure there's going to be something in my quarters. So once he's done feeding the animals, he goes back to his quarters and there's a a piece of bread. And he's defeated. Slowly eats that piece of bread and it's like, I don't know. Home looks pretty good right now. But there's no way dad would ever take me back. Tears start to fall from his eyes. For the first time in his life, he's feeling regret. And understanding, you know what, maybe dad was just trying to protect me all this time. Maybe he was right. He wakes up the next morning. There's already food for the pigs waiting for him. Crack of dawn. Light barely coming in. He gets up. Takes the food. Goes out to the pig pen and as he's putting some food in the pigs get really excited and as they come in to get some of the food he trips because one of the pigs comes up from underneath him and it knocks him right over he falls into the muck into the filth all of the pig stuff whatever that is and he's completely covered in pig filth and mud and he gets up he curses at the pig slams the door on the on the pen and then he goes to the next one with the food and all the wild tears streaming down his face thinking uh, there's got to be a better way than this and as he's feeding the pigs at the next one he looks at the pig food and he's like i haven't had anything to eat i hope nobody ever sees this and he takes a little bit of the food from the pig and he takes a small bite as he takes that bite that conscience that he had locked away comes back says you could go home I start to think I, I could never go home as a as a son but boy maybe if I'm like a servant uh, I, I can come back maybe I can just be part of my dad's paid staff I mean they certainly had it better than this maybe I can just go back I don't need to be a son but if I just work at it maybe he'll accept me back into the family and if not then I'll just be a servant for the rest of my life for my, who once was my dad. And he decides in that moment, covered in filth and muck and stuff, that he's going to drop everything and head back home. So he puts everything down, he leaves the gate, and he walks off the property, and he walks down the road back to his dad's house, hoping maybe that he can just be a servant. Restoration Church, welcome 
to Jesus and. That might have been the longest intro I've ever done, and we're going to get back to that. But we've got some scripture to go through today. We're going to be in Galatians, Galatians chapter 3. Uh, this is Paul speaking to the, to the Galatians, the church in Galatia. Uh, we're doing this series called Jesus, No And, Just Jesus. And the way that we've studied it, we're going through the book of Galatians. What we've done so far is Paul's been given a background on himself. Starting in chapter one, he addressed the Galatians, addressed what was happening. If you remember that, he addressed everything that was going to be uh, the, the issues at hand. And then he launches into a backstory because they were starting to question Paul's authority, who Paul was. So he shares his own testimony of how he found Jesus on the Damascus road. And then, uh, and then he gives an example of how he addressed one of their leaders, Peter, uh, and, and how he, he confronted Peter and how he's been fighting for Jesus alone this entire time. And so that's what we've had from chapter one and chapter two. And finally, in chapter three, he is addressing the church in Galatia for the first time since chapter one. And so since I started so long on the introduction on that story, I hope you dug it. We're going to get into it a little bit more a little bit later on. Just we're going to leave it as a cliffhanger for right now. Um, but we're going to go into uh, Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. The Galatians know better, right? Okay, here we go. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Before we say anything else, let's read some scripture. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Oh, foolish Galatians, Paul is saying. Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia is another way of, in the Greek, it would be, oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. You can look it up. He's calling them idiots. You can think, but you can't use perception. You're able to use your mind, but you're not able to, to process it through. You guys are acting foolishly. Not only that, you're acting just like Peter. The reason Paul shared that story about Peter and him confronting Peter is because the Galatians and Peter are acting the exact same way. You know better. I, Paul says, I've been preaching the gospel of Jesus crucified since the beginning. That's all you've heard is Jesus crucified. That it is Jesus Christ alone. Uh, in verse 1, he says, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Now, a lot of them didn't actually see Jesus crucified, but they saw the testimony of Paul. They saw him preach. And so through Paul, they've seen Jesus crucified. And he was sharing the exact same argument with, with Peter. Peter, you don't have to be under the law anymore. Why are you doing that? So he's recounting what happened with Peter, and he's sharing it now with the Galatians to, to, to transform it to them and saying, now you're doing the exact exact same thing that Peter was doing. You know better. Peter knew better, and so do you. I taught you what this is. It's salvation through Jesus Christ alone. There's no other way in which we receive salvation. It's not through the law. And now you're trying to, to, to live a different way? L let me ask you, I, I just want to know one thing, is what Paul's saying. Like, tell me just one thing. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? If it's faith that saves us, then why should we turn to works after salvation to perfect it? If it's faith that saves us, why should we turn to works after salvation? He's saying, man, how did you get saved in the first place? Did the law save you or did the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit through, through the law or through, through, through faith? Was it because you heard or was it because you did something? It's a rhetorical question. It's a rhetorical question. The answer to the question is because you believed. Are you foolish? Are you so foolish having begun by the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? And then he says, uh, well, in verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? 
Bewitched translate to put the evil eye on. The uh, Greeks in this time, they were always afraid that they could be put under a spell of some sort by, by an evil eye. That if they looked at this eye, that that eye would be able to cast a spell on them and be able to like hypnotize them basically. It reminds you of like uh, the, 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 the story of, of Medusa who has snakes on her hair, right? Snakes, snake hair, and, and, and if she looks at you, you turn to stone. Um, th there's that. Uh, there's uh, Jafar from Aladdin. You remember that guy? Uh, he had the little the little staff thing that was like a serpent tea staff thing, and he could mesmerize the person, like looking at their eye. Uh, he would he would um, uh, like uh, like uh, the Eye of Sauron. Hey, anybody you know, Lord of the Rings fans? The Eye of Sauron, which would, if you put the ring on, it, it could control whoever was holding the ring. So Frodo would, would sometimes put the ring on whenever he needed to, and then he would be under. The, the Eye of Sauron would see him. All bad stuff would happen. You know what I'm talking about, right? So that's what they believe. This word bewitched is is uh, put the evil eye on. So he's, who has bewitched you? Who has, who has cast a spell on you? This is so insane, you guys. How is it that someone has put a, the, the only explanation is that someone has put a, a, a spell on you. How would you turn from the gospel of Jesus to now works of the law? You foolish Galatians, you idiots. Can you imagine if I preached that way? I mean, Paul is upset. Again, this is the very first time he's addressed the Galatians since chapter one. Now, we didn't have chapters back then. They weren't chapters. But for our reference, since one verse 11, chapter one, verse 11 was the last time. And he called them uh, the, his brothers. In this context, he's using a very formal um, uh, verbiage here. And he's saying, um, foolish Galatians. He's not saying foolish brothers. He's, he's keeping a distance between them because, man, you guys are going down the wrong path. Let's keep going. Verse four, did you suffer so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain, does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? What's it going to be, you guys? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you, uh, and, and, uh, sorry, and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Did you suffer so many things in vain? How did the Holy Spirit come upon you? Through, through works? Is it earned and deserved? Or did you believe and receive? See, the, what, what the Galatians, uh, what the legalizers in Galatia would believe and, and throughout all of the, the country here, is that you could earn it and you would deserve it. Paul was walking down that road before he met Jesus for the very first time. Well, like a life-changing way. Uh, he was walking down that road of, of being a Pharisee, a Sadducee. He, was, he knew that he could earn and, and he was deserving of it. If he lived his life in a certain way, he would deserve to be saved. And, and he obviously was wrong, um, and, and he's explaining that to the Galatians, and he's saying, man, was, it, was, was your salvation, was it earned and deserved, or, or was it just, did you just believe and receive? Again, that's a rhetorical question. We know that it was believed and received. Did we have to do anything to receive God's grace? Then why put so many stipulations on it now? It's a, it's a silly thing, and we do it today. This isn't just for the church in Galatia. This is also for us. We, we, we tend to, like, we have this experience where we get saved. We understand who Jesus is. We decide to follow him with our lives. And then we put all of these stipulations on what it must be for somebody else to come to terms with who Jesus is. Well, now you're going to have to act like us. Now you're going to have to dress like us. Now you're going to have to be more like us and do the things that we do. And because that's what it means to be saved. And if you're not going to do that, well, then we're going to have some issues. He's saying, did you suffer so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? Like, and, and that word suffer can actually either be suffering or experiences. Now, we know that they had both. Now, uh, if it's the experiences side of things, he was saying, did you experience so many things in vain? Uh, that that the, the experience of, of the Holy Spirit coming into your life, of you getting saved, these mountaintop peak experiences in your life, like were they all in vain so that you could now be a slave to the law? Did you, or, or, or if it is the, the term suffering, it works both ways. You guys have been fighting against legalism for so long. I've been in this fight with you. We've been in this fight together. Remember, it was in this time uh, that he, Paul was stoned. 
um, by the legalizers in, in this area of Galatia. Paul was stoned and left for dead. In fact, some say that he might have died in, in that time when he got stoned. I think it was Acts chapter 14. Don't quote me on it. We've already read the story in a previous week. So if you want to go back and find it, feel free to do so. So he, he's saying, we've suffered so much and you're going to turn your back now? You're, you're turning your back now. We are on this journey. We've been saved by faith. We've been walking so well. Now all of a sudden we're going to turn our backs on, on, on the gospel? And, and I feel the same way here today with the church of, man, we do so many things and, and, and we try so hard sometimes. It's like, why are we we, we were so close to the gospel. We were so close. And then we turn our backs on it. Whether to, to go after the law, to go after works, to start living by a, because it, it's a lot of work, you know, having a relationship with Jesus, spending time with him, studying, like praying, all that. Boy, you know what would just be a lot easier? It would just be so much easier if we just, you know, if we, um, if we would, if we would just have to follow some rules, you know, that would probably be better uh, for my time commitments. Uh, I wouldn't have to, you know, then, then if you, if you could just tell me what to do and then like, uh, and then I can just devote a little bit, compartmentalize my life a little bit. Uh, that would be, that would be so much better. No, we follow after Jesus. Did you suffer all of these things? Did you experience all of these things in vain so that you can go back to a different lifestyle? <clears throat> Philippians 1 6, he also writes this. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. If we're going to trust God, if we're going to trust Jesus with our salvation, why are we not going to trust him with the rest of our life? Why do we say, okay, great, I'm going to, I'm going to trust you initially, but then I'll take care of the rest. Here's the deal. God is the initiator of our salvation. That word initiator, I don't know if it's a real word, but it's real theology, okay? God is the initiator of our salvation and the one to bring us to perfection in him. That's it. We are not a part of this equation. The only equation we have is Jesus Christ. That's it. That's where we get all of our, our worth is from Jesus Christ and him alone. He's the one who initiates our salvation and he's the one who perfects our salvation. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work, he started the good work in you, is faithful to complete it. We'll bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. We're not going to be complete until the day Jesus Christ returns or we meet him in heaven. That's the way that it's going to go. And so trying to pile on all of these other things, we turn our eyes onto all of these other things. Who's bewitched you? Who is, who, uh, what evil eye are you looking at? How are you, how are you not focused on this? Man, you know what we need to do? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. You know, like the, I, I was going to do a completely different point, but I love old hymns. And so I decided I was going to just borrow the line from, from that old hymn. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we could do this a different, a different way. Oh, foolish American Christians. Who has bewitched you? Ooh, now it's not just a history lesson anymore, is it? Oh, foolish American Christians, who has bewitched you? Why have you gone so far? Why, why aren't you looking at Jesus anymore? Why am I trying to find my worth in, in doing works for the church? Why am I trying to find my worth in building this church up? Why am I trying to find my worth in, in people accepting me and liking me? I need to continually turn my eyes upon Jesus. I can get so distracted by things right here on this earth and, and, and to things that, that are going to make me feel better, that are going to make me look better in a different light. Man, when all that matters is God who initiated the work in me is also going to be the one that perfects me. So why don't I just focus on him? I know there's political stuff happening. I know there's cultural stuff happening. I know there's divides all over the place. At least that's what they're trying to tell us that there is. But man, what if, church, just, just go with me for a second. What if we just turned our eyes upon Jesus? One of my 
good friends, comes to restoration. He shared this with me um, in our men's group. He said, uh, back when the election was happening, um, just, I don't know whenever that was, seems like it was like 15 years ago, but uh, w whenever the last election was in uh, 2020, oh, no wonder we forgot, um, a, a lot of people, there was a lot of divide, there was a lot of passionate arguments going on, and and my friend simply said to a, to a guy that was having an issue with it, he was he just said, man, we're not electing a new Jesus, so what are you getting all up in arms about? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. See, we have a tendency when we read Scripture to be like, oh man, yeah, those stupid Galatians, those idiots, they didn't know what they were doing. Man, sometimes reading Scripture is like a mirror. And it's not Paul that I'm looking like, it's like the Galatians. I'm going after works, I'm going after making myself look better, I'm going after, I've got a two-faced, I'm hypocritical, I'm whatever. I'm headed for the pig pen. He says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Stop looking all around. Who is it that saved you? Let's keep going. We've got a few more verses to go through today. I know it feels like we're, we haven't even started, right? Verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Whoa, hold on. Let's go back to Galatians 3, 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Let me read that one more time. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Oh, man. Keep going. We'll get, we're going to come back to this. Now, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Now, Paul does something brilliant here. I am sure what the legalizers were trying to do, the Jewish legalizers, they were trying to get them to eat the right foods, to be circumcised, and to obey all of the laws. So 613 laws is what they had to obey. Now those 600, we don't have time to get into it right now. Another time we will, I promise. Uh, maybe next week. <clears throat> What Paul is, what the legalizers are doing is saying, listen, we want you to be circumcised. We want you to not eat this food and we want to follow all those things. All of that started, what they're going to claim is, is with our buddy, uh, our forefather, Abraham. You know, Father Abraham, he had many sons. I am one of them and, and uh, maybe you will be um, if, if you do the right things, right? And, and Abraham, boy, he, he, he was told by God that they had to be circumcised if they wanted to be, you know, a part of that club. And that's what they, they're going to manipulate the scripture and be like, okay, so you got to be circumcised if you want to be a part of this club. Because obviously, if you're a follower of Abraham, then uh, you, you got to be circumcised if you're joining our club. But what Paul is saying is that, hey, Abraham, he was righteous because he believed God. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. You can read that whole part in Genesis 15 verses 1 through 6. Abraham's having kind of a crisis of faith. He's old. He doesn't have uh, any legitimate children at this point. Um, and, and, and God says, listen, I'm going to make you a nation. And then when... Um, when Paul is, says this in verse 6, he's directly quoting Gala or Galatians. He's directly quoting Genesis 15, verse 6. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul goes to an unlikely source to prove his point. The Old Testament, the books of the law, what the, what the Jewish Christians were trying to throw in their face, Paul also takes and rescues the entire thing, saying, okay, you want to go to the Old Testament? Let's talk about the, the biggest one of all, the patriarch, Abraham. You know he was saved by faith, not works, right? And all the Galatians are probably like, uh, what? Uh, you, 
N no, he had to get circumcised. No, 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 that was just a, the, the circumcision was just to identify that he was going to be following God. If we do the exact same thing today, not with circumcision, we do it with baptism. You're welcome. We do it with baptism now. And if you want to be baptized, we would love to baptize you. But that is a sign of the covenant between us and God. The circumcision at that point was a sign of the covenant between Abraham and his people and God. That's all that it was. It wasn't a way of salvation. It was just to signify a covenant is being made. And, and, the, and the Jewish legalists are probably getting angry at this. There's no way Gentiles, they, that, <clears throat> there's no way the Gentiles have anything in common with their great founder, Abraham. No way can Gentiles have anything in common with Abraham. See, the, gen the, the Jewish people are probably upset because they've had to follow all these rules for so long. It's like, no, we know God better. We have the deep cuts, all right? N not, we're, that wasn't, you get what I'm saying, okay? Uh, that wasn't a slip of the tongue. Uh, it's, it's like, it's like um, so me and my family, we are huge 21 Pilots fans, okay? This is going to make sense in a second. Um, we love going to see 21 Pilots in concert. We love it. Uh, we, we've seen them a few times. And my oldest son, Carson, he specifically is in love with 21 Pilots more than any of us combined, probably. Um, it's something I passed on, and I'm pretty proud of that. But he, like, there's, if you dive into it, there's, like, backstory behind albums. There's whole stories that's going on. There's this whole narrative that's happening. And he always does this thing where it's like, okay, so your favorite song from 21 Pilots is stressed out. So are you really a fan? Really? Well, what about the deep cuts? What about all this kind of stuff that I know that you don't? If you were a true fan, here's what you would actually believe. Here's what you would actually know if you were really a true fan. And I'm like, dude, I, the, people can be a fan of a band. They don't have to be like you as a fan, but they're still a fan of that band. The, the, basically, the, gen, the Jewish people are saying, okay, if you're going to do this, we've got to do all of these things too. And they're like, no, I don't think we have to. The deep cuts are are, are cool, but... And, they're, they're not a priority for me to be a part of this. I don't know if that makes sense. I might not say that on Sunday. Anyway, uh, Abraham believed in God and believed God, which is our second to last point for the day. Believe God. Legalists can believe in God, but won't believe God and his promises. Jesus says, and we covered it in, in the room, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, Paul talks about it all in Romans and throughout all of his letters. It's clearly marked in the gospel that we are saved by faith alone. It is through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone um, in which we are saved. God sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's all through Jesus Christ. And if we can believe, legalists can believe in God, but won't believe God. See the difference? You'll believe in something. Yes, that person is real. That, per that is a real thing. I believe in that thing, but I'm not going to believe that thing for me. It's like this, okay? So uh, it's getting to be summertime. We put up a hammock in our yard, or, or at least we're, we're going to be doing that soon. And, and you know how it is when you put up a hammock in your yard? Like the very first time you get in it, you so you, you, you put the hammock out on the between the trees or posts or whatever it is that you've got. And it's one thing to just look at the hammock and be like, okay, yes, that's a hammock. I believe in that hammock, that that what I'm seeing right there is a hammock. It's a total other thing to believe the hammock is going to hold, right? And, and especially if I'm the one doing it. If I'm holding on to the, the, if I'm the one that put the hammock together, there's a good chance it's not going to go well for me. Believing the hammock is getting in the hammock. Believing the promise of the hammock, that the hammock is going to hold me, the hammock is going to stay up, that the trees are going to be right, everything that the manufacturers did everything correctly, that this is going to work. It takes a little bit more, what? Faith? Oh, faith, yeah, to, 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 to get in there. And now I could, <laughs> I could support it even more. I could put wood underneath the hammock and then like make this whole stand and, and do a whole bunch more work so that when I got in the hammock, I know that it's going to stay in place, but it's not going to be that comfortable, is it? The wood might give at some point, it's going to look stupid and it's not going to be that great of a hammock. Or I can trust the process of the hammock and the, and the manufacturers, the engineers, all the people that did this stuff to know that this is strong enough to hold me. 
And believing the hammock is me getting in the hammock. So there's a difference between believing in God and believing God. A lot of people believe in God. Yeah, I believe there's a God. I believe in God. Sure. Yeah, but are you living like you believe God and his promises for you? That he loves you no matter who you are. That he sent his son to die on a cross for you. Do you believe God when he says that I love you? Do you believe God when he says that while you were yet sinners, I sent my son to die for you? Or are we going to put our own spin on it, trying to do our own works? Because if we're going to try to do this on works alone, then we're not believing God. We believe in God, but we're not believing God. It's like the story that I was sharing at the beginning of this message. The son started heading back home for the first time. He had tried the world and it didn't work for him. And as he's heading down the road, he's reciting the words over and over and over and over again. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but I'll be a servant. And he's reciting those lines over and over. I'm not good enough to be your son, but I, I, I'll be your servant. And as he gets closer to the house, he comes up over a hill and he looks over and he sees the familiar land, the trees, the, 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 the house, the fences, the animals, the servants, the driveway, all of it is so familiar to him. And as he's walking down the road, it seems like an eternity. Every step is harder. Every step is, is there, there's more shame, more guilt, more stuff laying on him as he takes those steps further and further and further towards the house. And off in the distance, he sees somebody come out of the house and there's people pointing up at the driveway. And, the, and, and somebody starts running down the driveway and the son, filled with shame, he's just looking down. He can't even look up at this point. And he sees that it's his dad coming, running up towards him. Well, he doesn't see a whip in his hand for a beating, so we know that's not what's coming. He's not sure what to expect. And as he approaches his dad, he starts to take the words out, Dad, I'm, I'm not worthy to be your son, but I'll be a servant. And as he's saying that, the dad just wraps his arms around the son, all smelly, sweaty, gross from the journey, and just holds his son and says, I love you. You've returned. You were dead, and now you're alive to me. We're going to have a feast. No works required. Just repentance. And they go and they have a feast. And the older brother, he gets upset about this, that there's a feast going on, and uh, he had never left. So he's staying outside the party. He puts, um, the younger brother has on his dad's robe, a signet ring, like all the stuff. There's a whole celebration, the fatted calf, the whole thing is happening. They're having a huge celebration. And the father notices the oldest son, he's out, outside. He, he doesn't want to come in. And so the, the, the father heads out to the oldest son. And he's like, why are we throwing a party for that idiot? He squandered your inheritance. He did all this stuff and, and we're throwing him a party? I've stayed here. I've been faithful to you. And the father says, man, my son, if he, he, he was dead and now he's alive. Don't miss this. He brings the son in. Jesus shared that story in the gospel of Luke of the prodigal son. Man, that, that younger son, he knew better, didn't he? Yeah, he knew better. He knew what was before him. He had grown up in this, in this home, and he knew better. And he still left, and he did a whole bunch of stuff that he shouldn't have done. And wanting to come back, he was going to work his way back. But the father said, no, there's none of that. I'm letting you in.
And the reason that story shares so much and, and so many people know the prodigal son story is because man, that's a lot of us, isn't it? Now, some of us haven't always gone to the depths that some people have, but we're somewhere on the road, whether towards the pig pen um, and, and the freedom that we think we might have, or we're on our way back towards God. But before we come back to God, we feel like we need to get this pig stain off of us, this pig filth, this pig poop, whatever it is, like all of that, we need to wash it off before we come to him. And, and what Paul was saying here in Galatians and what Jesus is saying with the prodigal son is, man, you come here sweaty, smelly, dirty, not clean whatsoever. Let me do the job of cleaning you is what Jesus said. I'm going to let you in regardless of who you are. God loves you. Do you believe God that he loves you as you are, not as you should be? Because you'll never be as you should be. Some of us are, are, are somewhere on this road. So the question for us this uh, day is, are you in the pig pen at the party or somewhere in between? We can take an honest inventory of our lives and be like, okay, where am I at? Everyone's somewhere on it. Some of us feel like we need to get cleaned up. Some of us have abandoned our faith and we've gone to more of a workspace thing. Like, I've got to make sure I do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Now, I got to be perfectly clear here. There are things that we should not do, okay? It's clearly listed in the Bible. Probably not going to cheat on my wife. I'm probably not going to um, start using hard drugs. I'm probably not going to make addiction a part of my life. I'm probably not going to start following other gods, okay? But there's these other things that keep getting thrown in that are saying, if you want to be saved, here's the things that you also have to do. Um, you know, the Sabbath is for you. I can eat whatever I want to eat. Okay, like some of some of those types of things. I can I can go see movies now. There's some movies I'm not gonna go see just because of the content that's in them. It's about the heart. See the the, the thing with legalism and the thing with following Jesus is, what's the engine that's driving it? What's the engine that's driving the decisions that we're making on a day-to-day -day basis? Not to see that movie, not to drink that, not to smoke that, not to eat that, not to date that person, or not to do whatever. Is it a workspace thing where it's like, God will love me more if I don't do these things? Is that the engine that's driving it? Because I'm going to tell you right now, that engine is a workspace engine. Or is it, man, I owe everything to Jesus. And I want to keep myself pure for Jesus. Now, y'all can do whatever you're going to do, but I love Jesus so much that I'm just going to, I'm going to follow him. I'm going to turn my eyes upon Jesus. And is the engine that's driving my decisions, is it Jesus or is it so that God will like me more? So what part of the road are you on? Are you in the pig pen right now? Disgusted. Not sure where to turn. Are you back at the party? Maybe you've recently gotten saved or made a rededication to your life. Maybe you're the younger brother and you're just living in this moment. Don't forget this moment. Don't turn back. Or maybe you're the older brother who's judging. Why are we throwing a party for that guy? Can't believe that guy actually says he's a Christian. Can't believe she's here. Doesn't she know what she's done? Maybe we're somewhere in between on the road trying to get ourselves clean before we come to him. God loves you just as you are. Jesus died for you just the way you are. And he loves you. Father, thank you so much for what you've done for us. Thank you for the love you have for us. I pray that uh, we as a church would continue following you. God, we would turn our eyes upon you. God, we would be honest and take an inventory of our lives and where we're at on this path. We identify with the prodigal son, whether we're on the way back towards you. God, we can make it a quick one. I just feel like I'm surrendering it all. Some of us are in the pig pen trying to figure out what we did with our lives. Others are headed that way. God, help give us the discernment to know what to do next. Thank you for your sacrifice of your son Jesus on the cross for our sins. 
and that through him we have life because he lives in us. God, thank you for all these things, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen.